the Los Angeles Basin. It's Friday. Starring Mark Blankfield, Mary Edith Burrell, Melanie Chartoff, Larry Davis, Daryl Igus, Brendis Kemp, Bruce Mahler, Michael Richards, John Rourke, and special guest star, Graham Parker and the Rumor. And I am Jack Burns. And I recognize the gentleman from the state of New York. The Empire State, after caucusing during the opening credits and realizing we are in a position to put Reagan over the top and thereby put him in our debt so he'll send federal money funding our way are bailing out on a number of candidates whom some of us think are more qualified, but they can't do diddly for us now. So we are going with the one who has a lock and cast all 123 delegate votes for the next president of the United States if he doesn't screw up <laughs> Ronald Reagan! As you have just seen, Ronald Reagan's nomination was made unanimous, and he is, as was predicted, the Republican nominee. Who his running mate will be is probably the only surprise left for this evening, and perhaps my co-anchor for tonight might have an opinion on that. Well, Mary, whoever he chooses has to be a man of integrity, strength of character and intelligence. But the most important quality he must have is the ability to kiss backsides. Now, do you have any idea who his choice might be? Well, I thought the governor of Illinois demonstrated all the qualities I mentioned. He was in favor of the ERA, but when he heard he was in the running, he reversed his stand and supported the anti-Reagan forces. That's the kind of commitment to selling out that makes a good vice president. Ah, well, uh, Mr. Nixon, Mr. Reagan should be arriving at the convention center shortly, so let's get back to the floor, shall we? Uh, as I was saying, Mary Edith, I was with Barbara in China, and I asked her if she wanted to drink. And she said to me, First of all, 
As a clergyman, I'm not supposed to be political. <laughs> but oh Lord, how good it is to see that this party has attempted to reach out and take into its bosom every race, every creed, every color. And oh Lord, <laughs> he's been accused of being too old. And yet old age and old folks are the farthest thing away from his mind. As a matter of fact, he's the only candidate who has governor for to keep old folks out of the old age homes by cutting back on the funds needed to run them. Are you trying, to, are you trying to kill us? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we just got word Ronnie has arrived outside the convention hall. throughout this various country. Uh, so many decent people like uh, yourselves dear, come I up to Nancy dear, and I and say... Excuse me, I, I don't mean to upset you, but it, it's a bust. Well, I'm not holding anything. Uh, <laughs> only uh, only my memory pills. Uh, I forgot the other ones. Oh, dear, dear, uh, they're waiting for us inside. Well, let them wait. You know, it's the little people, like this gentleman, who are the backbone of this country, you know? Look at him, he's, he's handicapped. No arms, no legs, no torso. Yet he's come to the convention. <laughs> Ronald's only joking. He has a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> no, I, I'm not joking, Nancy. If elected, my opponent would put a handicapped man like that on welfare. But that man has cards. If elected, remind me of, remind me again the job as a, as a geek and a sideshow. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It is a great honor to be chosen as president of the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, my opponents, such as Walter Houston and S.C. E. Cuddles the Call, are all good men, but they're too old to lead this union uh, in Ronnie, what we have. Ronnie, this is for the president of the United States. Did you take your pills? Oh, yes, I did. I, I, was, I was just drawing a parallel. You see, there's no great difference in driving the commies out of Hollywood, as we did in the 50s, and driving them out of Afghanistan now. It's just a longer drive. Yeah! You know, uh, in, our, in our travels throughout uh, this great country, people come up to Nancy and I and say, when are we going to stop talking about nuclear weapons and start using them? Yeah! And I, and, I say, and I say to them, in, in 1960, we had the capability to destroy the world ten times over. Now we have only the capability to destroy the world eight times over. I think it's a, a sorry statement about this country uh, when, when world population is growing faster than our ability to wipe it out.
Well, I, I think it's the best means we have to measure a pitcher's performance. The Equal Rights Amendment! You haven't even considered a woman vice president! Excuse me. Excuse me, may I say something here? I'm sorry. As a woman, I am proud to say that my husband is about to announce his choice of vice presidential candidate. <laughs> Well, it has been a, a difficult decision. Uh, all those who sucked up to me these past few months have been, have been, have been good, decent men. Uh, but I believe we need a balanced ticket. Uh, someone who has great youth appeal, who is experienced in appearing before the public eye. Uh, but more important, someone who is just as fit to assume the highest office in the land as any other political figure I know. Well, they say that politics makes us strange bedfellows, but not in this case, because he and I first slept together long before I married Nancy. Uh, I give you the next Vice President of the United States, Bonzo! Well, it is getting late. Looks like it's bedtime for Bonzo, and it appears that Mr. Reagan has already fallen asleep. So from Convention Central, this is Mary Edith Burrell reporting. been a good girl about brushing. <laughs> Open up, honey. Let Daddy see the space. Oh, I think I see a new tooth coming in already. Oh, you're growing up so fast, <laughs> sweetie. Mommy, Mommy and Daddy, can I put my tooth under the pillow? Sure, sure. 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 <laughs> Mommy? Hmm? Is there really a tooth fairy? Heather and Rita says there's not. Well, of course there's a tooth fairy, sweetheart. Daddy, yes, sir. Tell me the truth. Well, honey, if you really want the truth, no, no, there's, there's no tooth fairy. I thought so. And it's the same with Santa and the Easter Bunny, huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. dear, they're fake too. Now, time for nighty night. <laughs> okay, but mommy, first, could I ask one more thing? Hmm. Are you really my mommy and daddy? <laughs> Heather and Rita says you're not. Oh, no, honey. We're fake, too. <laughs> you pretend mommy's right, sweetheart. You see, I'm an actor, and she's an actress. Now, what do you think of that? Well, if the tooth fairies are fake, and you and mommy are fake, mm -hmm. then who's gonna put the money under my pillow for me when I fall asleep? Nobody, Pumpkin, because this isn't your pillow, and this isn't your bed. Mm. As a matter of fact, this really isn't your room. It's all just a make-believe set. See? It's just as fake as the Tooth Fairy. Years old? Heather and Rita says I'm not. 
No kitten. You're a grown-up actress. You have bosoms, Peaches. Oh, you certainly do, honey bunch. <laughs> and from the moment you climbed out of bed, Every single person watching has spent some time eyeing your scrumptious grown-up body in those little girl pajamas. And that's why you're wearing them, Pumpkin. Because this is television. And showing sex-related material, such as the soft skin of your thigh, keeps people watching. <laughs> and sponsors like that, Sugar Plum. Okay, come on, back to bed, all right? Come on. Is television good, Daddy? Heather and Rita says it isn't. No, honey. Television sucks. <laughs> there are some good programs, honey, but most of them are superficial. <laughs> On the other hand, there are things about this sketch that are kind of pretentious. But that's not the worst part, baby. You see, there, the whole, there are so many bad things, and, and well, would you like to play a game so we could show you what we're talking oh, about? Oh, yes, Daddy. Okay. Okay. okay? Come on. All right, let's pretend that this is a window to all the places where people are watching. Uh-huh. <gasps> Look, I see some people sitting on a couch. And nobody's talking. And I see some people in a bar watching us. Oh, that guy in the plaid shirt, boy, is he really drunk. <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh, I see some people making love on the floor. They're not watching us at all. And look, there's a TV critic, probably missing the whole point of this sketch. <laughs> Well, honey, it's like this. Television is like your sick Uncle Bill. <laughs> now, he's easy enough to ignore, but everybody stops talking and watches when he drops his pants and dances. Well, I think it's time to go back to bed, okay, honey? Come on. Okay. <laughs> Up we go. Oh, Daisy, dear. Under the covers, you get nice and warm. Honey, I hope you're not upset that there's no tooth fairy, sweetheart. Well, I think it's best that you learn what's true and what isn't. Right. We're just some actors spending some time in a pretend world. Outside, in real life, is where the truly important things happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mommy? Hmm? I have one more question. What? Are you jealous of me because I get more airtime during the Friday edition than you do? <laughs> and Rita say you are. <laughs> well, honey, we'll talk about that in the morning a little bitch. Not <laughs> Next on the Friday edition, Weasels Rip My Flesh. This is the Friday edition with your correspondent, Melanie Chardoff. Good evening, I'm Melanie Chardoff, and these are tonight's top stories. President Carter returned home yesterday after an eight-day European tour, which included stops in Italy, Spain, and Yugoslavia. Larry Skunk Matthews, a roadie for the Carter tour, described the trip as difficult, saying, we couldn't get no drugs, and when we mentioned Jimbo's name, we couldn't get no chicks neither. <laughs> the number one question on the minds of most Americans is, who shot J.R. Ewing on Dallas? However, Friday Edition has learned that on a PBS Dick Cavett show, which is to be aired next week, G. Gordon Liddy will confess to the J.R. shooting. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, who, according to recent polls, is favored to beat Jimmy Carter in the November elections, displayed his confidence that nothing can now hurt his chances for victory by molesting a five-year-old girl at a Los Angeles <laughs> press conference. Because of what were termed similarities between the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and the recent attempt on National Urban League director Vernon Jordan, the FBI this week interviewed John Larry Ray, the brother of James Earl Ray, to determine whether he had any information about the Jordan shooting. 
Although the questioning turned up no new evidence, the FBI said they have not lost faith in the Ray line of inquiry. This week, agents plan to speak with Johnny Ray, Martha Ray, Alejandro Ray, Faye Ray, Bob and Ray, and all boxers named Sugar Ray. <laughs> Tonight's Friday Focus deals with refugees and the problems that they face in entering this country. For more on that story, we take you now to Mary Edith Burrell at the Port of Long Beach. The plight of the refugees. It's an ugly problem. First, there were the Vietnamese refugees, then the Cambodian boat people, and more recently, the Cubans. All of them fleeing their countries by the thousands, risking death so that they might come to the land of opportunity and make a new life for themselves. Yet many are disappointed. Case in point, the newly arriving mannequin refugees. Come on, get on there. Come on, let's go. Come on. These unfortunate mannequins have fled their native country of Manikinia, where live human models have forced them out of their homes and jobs. Immediately after arriving, these hapless refugees are subjected to the tedious immigration process which is compounded by the fact that few mannequins speak or understand the English language. Name. Name. Oh, these are all the same. Dumber than a doorknob. Go on, get out of here. Move it! The unfortunate refugees are then forced to live temporarily in run-down relocation camps, never knowing what lies in store for them. I don't want them here. I mean, look, they take away jobs from our own mannequins. Besides, we don't know what these things are. They could be criminals, prostitutes. We'd never know. And unfortunately, some will sell themselves to private citizens, where they will be humiliated and forced to cater to their owners every whim. And finally, they are the victims of governmental harassment and blatant discrimination. They send us their scum, damn woody hookers. Yeah, if you're not careful, they'll give you splinters. <laughs> Come on, let's get him. Yeah. Immigration officers, you're under arrest. I, I didn't Come do anything. Across. Wait a minute. Come on. Those are my women. Oh, hey. Uh, hey. <laughs> no self-respect, no hope, and no future. For these mannequins, the American dream has become the American nightmare. For Friday Focus, this is Mary Edith Burrell reporting. Finally, when ABC's late night program Fridays premiered 10 weeks ago, some critics called it tasteless, unfunny, geared to sex, drugs, and rock and roll mentality, and claimed, and claimed it would not survive. Apparently, the television audience didn't agree with them because today, ABC announced it is renewing the show for another season. I'm Melanie Chardoff. Have a really good weekend. I know we will. This has been the Friday edition with your correspondent, Melanie Chardoff. And now, here is Graham Parker and the Rumor! Sit there, cameras without action. I can't see the point.
documentary by one of our team, Tommy Kramer, and here is his film. All I can remember is that it was like having your spine snapped in two. It was brutal, like dropping a bowling ball on your foot. Anything else? I don't think I liked it. I used to be afraid of being gray face down on a rough concrete sidewalk with my front teeth scraping against the cement. <sighs> I used to hate having these eight-inch wide bubbling blue blitzes all over my neck. Now the only thing that bothered me is waking up to the sound of Scottish bag. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. That didn't hurt now, did it? No, Dad. I'm Dr. Leonard H. Sylvian. You know, with the advent, the help, as it is, of primetime television, government agencies, um, technological research, soon the possibility of feeling pain will be completely eliminated from our lives. The history of the ending of pain is obscure, but we have found a pioneer in the field. Charles Joel, age 34. Charles Joel came to our clinic about 10 years ago looking for some way to eliminate pain from his life. We had first considered scraping any pumas from the mandibular section of his brain. <laughs> then there was the possibility of suctioning out any abscesses from the pubulus glands. Finally, we decided to subject him to acupuncture. Charles Droll claims his life has been enriched by the use of acupuncture and the one to interrupt his normal daily routine. There are many misconceptions about pain in the dental chair. But with today's anesthetics and the up-to-date improvements in oral surgery, we believe pain has fairly well been eliminated from dentistry. In fact, we like to think that a visit to the dentist is now a pleasurable and gratifying experience. Do you feel this is just a passing day? Oh, no, not at all. You can rest assured there's no longer any reason to be afraid of the dentist. <laughs> this is our city's stimulating sports arena, and the stunning essence of Noah King is spreading. But to be thoroughly convinced, it's good to hear it from the right mouth. With me is Pauline Craven, a member of the Mayor's Committee on Comfort. Pauline, it's no secret you recently had some complicated head surgery. So is there anything you could tell us that would ease the worries of prospective patients? <laughs> you already have your own way of diminishing the pain that you now have. But it's a comforting thought, and it's true. Pain doesn't hurt anymore. I'm glad we can finally get down to the business of life.
once again, Graham Parker and the Rumor. <laughs> Thank you.
Can I help you with something? Uh, yeah, I'm on the prowl for some jeans. Uh, not just ordinary jeans, though. Uh, uh, designer jeans. Maybe from France. Maybe Denmark. Well, that's all we sell here. Well, don't worry, I got the money. Any particular style in mind? Well, I kind of like them blue and I kind of like them tight. What's your size? Well, that shouldn't be too hard to guess. <laughs> Big. Well, why don't we measure just to be sure, huh? Okay. <laughs> oh, you better watch it. You're gonna burn your fingers. Your size is on that rack and on this rack right here, okay? okay? You're welcome to use a dressing room, you know. Oh, okay. Right back here. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'll tell you one thing right now. I might just buy two. these fit. <laughs> yeah, they, they feel good. Real good. How do they look? Huh? Well, uh, look a little tight to me. Why don't we check it out in the mirror? Okay. <laughs> look a little short, too. Uh, I, I kind of like them short. It gives attention to the socks. I like that. Yeah. You know, a man's home is his castle, but a man's clothes are his drawbridge, if you get my meaning. Now, if the drawbridge is up, well, how can you get to the castle to get your trousers? Great. You bet. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I'm a little worried that these pants may not be able to give me the kind of movement I need. As you may have noticed, I'm very much a dancer. Yeah. yeah, they'll give me what I need. These legs of mine, they need a lot of freedom. I got a little carried away there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, kind of like this one. Hi. Uh, uh, can we ask you something? Well, why not? I'm a man and you're a woman. <laughs> We've been watching you and we were wondering uh, are you joking around? Uh, see, what we mean is they're like you playing a joke or, or practicing for a play or something? Well, 
What I'm doing, ladies, is trying on some designer jeans. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll take these. And I'll uh, take the hat, too. And I'll just wear them out with me. Yeah, I think I'll take these, too. <laughs> Howdy. I think you look funky. Yeah. Yeah, I feel funky.